Hey guys, I think I am live. I'm just double checking if, yeah, I think we're live. Give me one second. You guys are watching are. us. Hey guys, this is Rob with Thinkific. Welcome to today's live session. Uh, we are, oh. I'm just, just gonna mute myself here. I'm hearing it twice. Hey, yeah. great. Um, great, guys, thank you so much for joining us. This is Rob with Thinkific. I'm the social media and uh, com uh, sorry, community manager here at Thinkific. And today we are gonna be joined with one of our experts, uh, Kim Garnett. Uh, Kim Garnett is based out of Victoria. She's working with a lot of our different course creators. If you guys are probably part of her inner circle, you guys will know her, she's amazing. And today she's gonna be sharing some insights, some strategies, some best practices on how to pre-sell your courses. For a profit. So I'm going to bring her on and she will start uh, teaching us today. So uh, give me one second. Kim, are you there? Hi, I'm here, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we are, I'm here in Vancouver, Kim's in Victoria, British Columbia, up here in Canada. Let us know where you guys are from. We really want to know that, kind of where everyone is. I know we've got, uh, Kim has, uh, Kim has students and members all over the world that she helps during her inner circle. I'll let her tell you more about that. Um, but today, yeah, we're gonna be talking about pre-selling your courses. So um, if you guys have any questions, drop them in the comments. And uh, Kim will be uh, giving us some tips and strategies, but she'll also be answering your questions. So definitely drop your questions in the comments. I'm gonna be kind of watching the chat and I'm gonna be asking uh, Kim your questions on your behalf. So um, yeah, Kim. How are you doing? Awesome. I'm fantastic. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me again. I'm super excited to talk about pre-selling. It's a hot topic. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great way to validate that you actually have an offer that is going to sell. Um, so we're going to be going into a, a little presentation. I'm going to share, you know, steps to pre-selling, uh, who pre-selling is for and who it's not and help you guys along a little bit with considering pre-selling as a way to actually create your course. So I would love, to, I would love to know where everyone is sort of at in the course creation process. Um, you know, have you created your course? Do you have an online audience? Um, you know, some of those, some of those questions I would love to know. So I'm going to tune into my as well and just see, um, see the answers to those questions as well as where you're from. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we've got uh, Richard, hey Richard, hey uh, Dennis, hey Janet, Dr. Kerry Rose, hey, thanks for joining us. Awesome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, like Kim said, she's gonna be talking about pre-selling your courses. So guys, let us know where you're from and what you're teaching. And also, hey, like, tell us if you're launched already and if you guys are already like, have your courses published, kind of where you guys are at. That way we can kind of understand, you know, who's watching and how we can help. Um, yeah. Sorry, Rob, let me interrupt. Um, yeah. Even if you have a course that's already launched, using a pre-selling strategy for future courses or other courses that you're thinking of creating or might produce um, can actually be super effective if you've already launched a course as well. Perfect, perfect. And I know yeah. me and Kim were kind of talking about this earlier, but um, we were also curious if any of you guys already have a, an established audience, meaning like, are there already people that are following you, whether that's uh, maybe through an email list, maybe through one of your social media channels on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram. Um, or a Facebook are, group that you're nurturing. Facebook group that you're nurturing, you know, um, YouTube, you know, podcasts. Is this something that you guys already are building, you know, uh, a following uh, within your niche, within your space. So let us know if that's, if that's something you guys are already doing. And um, that'll kind of help Kim, you know, sort of like frame her uh, presentation today. Absolutely. And any question, there's no, there's, for me, there's no stupid question. So even if you feel like it might have been answered, you know, somewhere else, ask anyways, um, because it's good learning for everyone, uh, no matter where you're at in this process, whether you're starting out or whether you've already launched, launched a successful course. Um, this strategy, um, you know, can be across the board. So ask your questions for sure. We're going to do a whole Q&A section, I think, as well, aren't we, Rob? Yeah, we're going to definitely have a Q&A session. Irina George says that she already has an email list and two Facebook groups, as well as a podcast that she's nurturing. 
awesome. uh, Angela has been building uh, an audience on Facebook and Instagram. Those are actually my two favorite channels when it comes to social media. Uh, Dennis has an email uh, email list as well. Um, great. Um, so yeah, it looks like people are already creating audiences there. So that awesome. hopefully that helps Kim. We've got some people from London. Um, Jean, hey, oh yeah, hey Jean, everybody oh. in New York. Hey guys, welcome. Hey, Thanks guys. for joining us today. Hopefully you guys uh, find value in this and helps you guys with getting your launch, uh, your courses out there. So yeah, Kim, uh, let's get started. I think awesome. Are, I'm super excited. Wanting to learn. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me jump in. Let me do a screen share here. Can you there make you me a host, Rob? You are the host now. There you go. Fantastic. And let me just make sure. Are you seeing my full screen now, Rob? Oh, I can't hear you now. I'm going to unmute you. Yeah, I'm, I see it. You're good. You're seeing your full screen. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm not one for long introductions. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of people in the group. You've probably seen me hanging around as well. So my name is Kim Garnett. I'm better known as Brainy Girl, and I am a Thinkific expert and ambassador. My company um, has two parts of it. One is service-based where we uh, set up Thinkific sites and do Thinkific builds for clients. And then uh, I've over 40 courses and two member sites where we teach course creators and novice course creators in particular, um, online marketing and digital technology. So that's a little bit about what I do. And today specifically, we're gonna talk about pre-selling your course before you even create it. So we'll start with a short presentation here where we'll cover the biggest mistakes that I see course creators making, who pre-selling works for and who it doesn't, the benefits of pre-selling your course, the steps to pre-selling your course, and then a quick case study of one of our students. Uh, then I think we're going to open it up for Q&As, and uh, I've also got a 10 critical steps to launch a course that sells. Uh, I think Rob's going to drop the link to that in the comments, and so there's a, um, a good little tool for you to, to use if you're just sort of starting out with course creation. So I have seen way too many entrepreneurs build a course first and then try to figure out how to sell it. If you are creating your course first and then thinking about how you're going to grow your online audience and who you're going to sell your course to, I hate to tell you, but you are doing it backwards. It's going to be really, really challenging if that's the way that um, the process uh, or the strategy that you're taking. So I know you're excited about creating a course and getting out to the world. And I know that you think that you know what your audience needs. But without an online audience, you actually have no one to sell your course to, and you don't even really know what their problems are, what your target audience problems and pain points are, and what solutions that they want and they'll pay for. So pre-selling only works if you already have an online audience. So an email list of warm subscribers or a YouTube channel uh, that you're consistently putting out content and interacting with your subscribers. A Facebook group maybe of people that you've been nurturing. So if you listen to your audience, they'll actually tell you what their pain points and problems are and what solutions they're looking for. And that is the data that you need to start the process of creating a course that sells an audience or email list, then now is the time to start creating that and start building this audience of people who will want what you have. If you don't do well under pressure or you hate deadlines, then pre-selling probably isn't for you either. On the flip side, I also know entrepreneurs who've told me that they've been building their courses for four years. I talked to a, a fellow today who's been building this for now. So having a deadline forces you to get cracking and get it done. So it is good for some people, but if you buckle under pressure, pre-selling is probably not for you. So then let's talk about why you would pre-sell your course. 
the first reason to pre-sell your created course is to validate that people will actually pay for your course. So I have lots of course creators who say to me, oh, I know it's what they want. Need. Actually, it, I know it's what they need is what they tell me. And the thing is, is that people don't buy a course and they particularly don't buy a course that they need. They buy a solution to their problem and they buy something that they want, that they think is going to be the solution to this problem. So just because you have a lead magnet or an opt-in or free video training that lots of people have opted into, if they haven't put their cash down, then all you have at this point is a theory that people will pay for your knowledge or the information that you have. So pre-selling where they actually have to put cash down is going to validate your theory. The second reason to pre-sell is to get the cash flow required. Yes, you need some cash to build your course. You'll probably have to invest in software uh, for email marketing, webinars, or video editing. You might need to purchase some equipment like a microphone uh, or a tripod or maybe even renting a filming location. You might need to outsource some of your copywriting or graphics or um, invest in online advertising. Or you might need to take time off work to build this course. In all of those cases, you are going to need some cash flow. And so pre-selling your course can give you that cash flow that you need to then build out the course. Rob, should I stop? Is there any questions so far or should I keep rolling? No, I think we, uh, no, I think we're good. Um, you guys, if you guys have any questions, if you guys are just joining us, uh, we're going live, we're here live with Kim Garnett, one of our experts, and we're talking about pre-selling your courses for a profit before you even start creating your course, which is, which is super important if you guys are just starting out. So um, yeah, definitely drop your questions into the comments. I'm, uh, I'm watching it there and uh, I'll ask Kim your questions if you guys have any, okay? So perfect. No, Kim, I think we're good so far, yeah. Awesome, thanks Rob. So let's talk. So now you know who it's for and who it's not and sort of what you need to be able to pre-sell. So let's look at some of the steps required to pre-sell your course. So step one is the decisions. So you've got to decide on a what I call a green light dollar value. So you might need to... Um, you know, decide that you need $15,000 in pre-sales before giving yourself the green light to create the course. So if you're pre-selling your course for $497, then you'd need 31 enrollments as the green light to go ahead and build the course. What you really want to, you want to make this decision up front. That doesn't mean you can't be a little bit flexible so that if you got 29 enrollments, you said, no, absolutely not. But you need to know sort of what your, your green light point is. Step two is then you go and create your, your pre-sales page. And so this is really easy to do with Thinkific, especially with the new site builder. And a pre-sale page isn't really much different from a regular sales page. You're going to need most of the same components, a captivating headline, um, the offer, who it's for, the benefits, the transformation, uh, testimonials, images, a sales video, the expected launch date, uh, countdown timer, bonuses, frequently asked questions, and price. Now, I know you're probably wondering how you're going to get testimonials if you haven't even created this course yet. But... If you're an authority on this subject and you've probably done one-on-one -on -one client calls or coaching or group calls or authored books or eBooks, you're going to have hopefully some reviews and testimonials on this, um, you know, your expertise on this topic. And you can use those on this pre-sales page. So step three is you're going to connect your email marketing service provider, your ESP. So ConvertKit or MailChimp or whatever you're using so that as people are purchasing this not yet created course, you can filter them into your email program and start to, you know, really help them get excited and hyped up about this uh, launch date of your course. Step four is you've got to create a welcome video 
which is really probably going to be the only curriculum inside your course. So you don't want them to buy the course where they're going to go through immediately and see that there's nothing in the course. So you can either put placeholders in there if you have an idea of what this is going to look like, which, you know, you should have some kind of outline. Um, but you definitely want a welcome video. Hi, thanks for, um, you know, joining us for this course, set the expectations. Here's how it's going to work. It's going to launch on June 4th. And, you know, the content is going to be dripped out, you know, two modules a week or whatever it's going to be. Um, or we're going to be delivering it live if you're going to be building it on the go with them. So what you don't want is you don't want them to have an empty course when they come into it. Um, now, you can put an extra handout or a PDF or a worksheet or an activity that you want them starting to work on between now and when the course starts. Um, but you don't want an empty course. You're going to at least need a welcome video in your curriculum. Step five is to start driving your warm traffic towards your pre-sales page. So again, there's warm traffic that you have been nurturing and connecting with. Uh, and I'm not talking about people who've been on your email list for six months and they haven't heard from you. That is not warm traffic. That is cold traffic. So I'm specifically talking about warm traffic. If you try and send cold traffic to a pre-sale page, you're not going to have any conversions. But if you've been engaging your audience and building your audience and keeping them interested in what you're doing and this particular topic, there's a very good chance and you've been listening to what they're asking for. If you're delivering it, chances are they're going to be pretty excited about what you have um, to offer them. So you want to push them towards this uh, pre-sales page and let them start enrolling. That cash that they put down is going to determine whether this is a topic that they want to learn about, um, whether your sales page is converting. So it might even be an idea if you have um, warm traffic in different locations, let's say you have an email list of a thousand, you might take 250 of those subscribers and send them to your pre-sales page. Look at what the conversions are, see how many people are actually buying in. And if you've got a low conversion rate, you probably want to look at your sales page. Send sales page and experiment and test it. Um, you don't want to burn up all of your warm traffic by sending them to a sales page and then find three people bought. So you want to sort of do it in, in increments if you can, so that you don't burn through all of your warm subscribers. So here's just a quick case study for you. And this is one of our most recent students. I think she's been in the inner circle for about three and a half weeks. Uh, her name is SJ. I think she actually might be on with us today. And she had a plan when she joined our membership group, our inner circle. She was going to use her Thinkific site to host uh, other course creators courses in her particular niche, which was a great plan. So we were helping her work this plan until she mentioned something in the group one day. And what she said was, I just asked a question in a Facebook group I'm part of about whether they'd be interested in a course on what she specializes in. I now have 500 plus emails from interested people, but I'm going to put this on the back burner till August. And we see this happening a lot is you have this plan in mind, this is how you're going to do it, and you may be missing opportunities that come up along the way. So this was an opportunity. So I asked SJ to get on a call with us, which is what we do with our members. We get on a call and I said to her, this is an opportunity. These people have expressed interest. They're a warm audience. And in two days, we had her pre-sales page together, her convert kit uh, integrated, her email set up, and she was ready to release the pre-sales page of a not yet created course to this warm audience. So as of yesterday, which I think it's been about 10 days maybe since she sent uh, the warm traffic to the pre-sale page, she has 184 pre-sales of her course that's not yet built. This was, you know, she had her green light in mind, her green light point. Um, she now has 184 people enrolled in this course. She has the cash flow to be able to hire some people to help with some of the administrative stuff um, that has now increased and to give her some breathing space to create this course. And so this course will launch June 4th. This will be her beta test uh, of this first iteration of her, of her course. And then 
close and then we'll relaunch with her again in September. So I just wanted to give you, um, uh, you know, sh show you that this, this actually can work really, really well with a warm audience. And so I think we're going to open it up for questions now, Rob. I'm all, uh, that's great. I'm all done. Yeah. 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 No, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Guys, if you guys have any questions, uh, Kim is here. I think that's really important, you know, when you are, you know, really getting started, you know, a lot of people and, you know, kind of taking a step back, a lot of people, you know, naturally will start creating their courses right away because thinking like basically assuming what their students are interested in just based on their experience, based on their knowledge and all those things. And so then they create the course, they spend a month, couple months, sometimes a year or more mm -hmm. really perfecting and creating this perfect, perfect course. And then they launch it to their audience and then they find out that there is no interest. There's no product market fit. Uh, so this approach, which we've seen uh, here at Thinkific work a lot better with um, the course creators that are using our platform is really understanding, you know, what their students, uh, their pain points are, what their needs are, what their goals are. Like Kim said, people aren't buying the content per se. They're buying the outcome, the results of taking your course, you know. So, um, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um Sorry, yes. Rob, can I, can I just jump in before you ask yeah. that first question? Yeah. So I, I think the thing to remember is that we don't go online searching for um, a course. If I'm going through a divorce, I'm not going to go online and search for a course on divorce. I'm going to look for uh, keywords like uh, how to get through a divorce, how to make sure that my children are okay through my divorce, right? Topics like that. I'm not looking for a course, but if a course pops up, that speaks to me, I might buy that course because it might be a solution to my problem. And we see this all the time of course creators creating a course that they're certain their audience needs and they might need it, but if you frame it in a way of, of what you think they need versus really listening to what they want or what their problems are, it's gonna be a heck of a lot harder to market that course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So people are searching for the outcome. They're not searching for the exact course name per se. Right. So, um, and they're probably not even searching for a course, Rob. They're yeah. searching for articles. They're searching for videos and, and you know, they, they could find your course in that, especially if you have a blog, you know, or a website that then leads them to that course. That's a different topic, but you know, they are searching for a solution. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'm going to jump in and see if there's any questions here. Laureen says that she's been working with Kim. She's awesome. That's great. Uh, I think we've got a couple of uh, Kim's members from her inner circle uh, joining us here. So hello to everyone. Hey, New guys. York. Hello again, guys. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Uh, Tamikia here. So she has a course that she's planning with an outline. The first two modules are planned. I don't doubt that there will be interest, but I have no following. How do you pre-launch with no following? So yeah, that's a really good question, actually. I'm sure that's on a lot of people's minds. So um, Kim, do you want to say a few words on that? You know, so somebody with no following at all, um, or maybe their following is not um, lined up with the course that they're planning to pre-launch, right? Yeah. So, maybe so the like, first question I'd ask to me, is it Tamika? Yep. First question I'd ask her is how does she know? Cause she said, I know, what did she say? I know that they want this. I know that they need this. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I know that they're looking for it. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly what I'm, what I'm saying is that we think, and we might be right, but, but you have to validate that theory. So if you think that they want that, topic or they want a solution to that problem, what I would be doing is getting together uh, an opt-in or a squeeze page and uh, starting to drive cold traffic there with an opt-in that is going to get them on your list and is going to validate this theory that this is the solution. And it might be a simple checklist. It might be a video, you know, a short video training. Um, the very first way to validate it would be through an opt-in or a freebie or a free gift. Um, and, and truthfully, you really, if you don't have an online audience of some kind, if you don't have an email list, if you don't have an online following, you have to think about who you're going to sell your course to. It's really hard to sell a course if you don't have an audience. 
So start by building the audience. Perfect. Perfect. Now, um, there's a couple, there's quite a few questions coming up here, but based on just even just following up on that, Kim. Um, so if you don't have an audience and you kind of want to, I mean, you could do it, you know, sort of creating a blog, creating like a following on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, what are some of the ways is Facebook ads? Is that something that people should consider? Um, you know, do you want to, my honest answer, Rob? Yeah. Honest answer. Honest, okay. real talk. Yeah. You're going to burn through a lot of cash driving cold traffic to an opt-in using Facebook ads. Yes, it could be a strategy, but it would need to be in com combination with other things. So, you know, I think it's important to think about how long do you want to be in this game for? Is this a long-term game for you or is this a make a quick buck game? Because to be honest, the, the, the course industry, um, it, it's like any other business online. You've really kind of got to be in it for the long term or at least, you know, the next five years, let's say, in which case you really have to start by growing an audience. You, you have to have people who follow you, who are interested in what you have to say, um, who are looking for the solution that you have. And there's, I mean, there's really no sort of quick, quick way to do this. Yes, you can burn through cash and you can drive a bunch of cold traffic to a squeeze page and see what your conversions are like. But I would be doing, I would be doing 90 days of content. And that's what we tell our inner circle members to do. 90 days producing content every day. So that's YouTube videos or Facebook lives. I mean, obviously video is the quickest way to connect with people and to, and to stir that emotion and for them to get to know you like you trust you. So 90 days of content and then look at where you're at. What are the comments on your videos? What are people wanting to learn or know? Um, as you're listening to that, you can be putting together, you know, I mean, definitely have a squeeze page or an opt-in page and be dropping it in the description for these videos. So you're sending traffic, cold traffic, right? They've watched a video and they think, oh, wow, I think, you know, I think Kim's got some cool stuff to say. Let me click on this link in the description. I want what she has, then they opt in and then we nurture them through email sequences, maybe retarget them with Facebook ads, but they're not, they're no longer cold traffic because they've trusted us enough to, to give us their email in exchange for something of value that we have. So I guess the answer is, in my opinion, it's like any other business. You can't open a storefront and expect to only be there for three months. Does that answer Perfect. your question, Rob? Yeah, that, that answers my question. Yeah, so I know, hopefully that answers your question. I think that's a really popular sort of question right now is, okay, so how do you, how do you drive traffic to your pre-sell landing page, right? If you don't have an audience. So like Kim said, you know, you can create content, you can create videos, you can Instagram, the hashtag, the whole hashtag thing on Instagram is that's a perfect way to get into uh, a topic, a niche that is already interested in kind of looking into, um, you know, what you are looking to teach, right? So and you've you can got to know your way. audience well enough to know where they are, right? Mm -hmm. Are they consuming on YouTube? Are they consuming? So Instagram might be your favorite thing to post on, but if your audience not hanging out on Instagram, you're going to have a hard time tapping into them. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So you've got to do some research and figure out where your people are, and then you go there. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, we've got some questions here and SJ's here. Hey, SJ. Um, good to have you here. So people are wondering what is the best price to pre-sell at? Is there some type of formula? Is there some type of, you know, um, I think it really depends is that more of a on part than it is like sort of science, I guess. Yes. I think it's a little bit of both. I think you need to consider things like, you know, are you creating, so you're, you're going to pre-sell your course, but then you have two ways of doing this. You could do, um, I'm going to use SJ as an example. You can do what SJ is doing, which is, you know, once, once her green light hit, then she started creating her, creating her content because her course is just that it's a course it's, there's no live component to it. It is a course that they take. The other option and the option that I actually think is a much better option is creating a course with your students. So creating it live, you know, so basically, um, let's say two live sessions a week, Tuesday and Thursday, you're going to have live, you know, video group calls. And before that 
um, group call, you're going to have an outline of what you think you're going to cover in that particular um, live stream or group call or what you're going to teach them. Email to them before or ask in your Facebook group if they're part of a Facebook group of yours. And the question is, we're going to be talking about um, chocolate cakes tonight. What questions do you have about chocolate cakes? And you take their feedback and you incorporate that in that lesson that you're going to deliver live. And then before the next lesson, you send an email and you say, tonight we're going to be talking about icing on the cake. What questions do you have about icing? Because we have our own ideas of what they want to learn, but they might be 10 steps behind us. And we may not have thought about some of the things that they actually want to know about icing. So they're helping us actually create the content. So my preference is to create it live and then, you know, call that your beta program. Like that's your tester, right? So if you're doing it that way, they've got a lot of live um, access to you. So you don't need to have a low price point because they're actually able to access you more than probably any other future course students are going to. So keep that in mind that it doesn't need to be rock bottom pricing just because you haven't delivered it in this way before. I like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we get asked that question a lot as well. And we are on the side of definitely charging or some people will, you know, give their pre-sale or sorry, their um, pre-sell their courses for free. You know, right. But again, it goes want. back to my validation. Yeah. You can't val if, so, if no one pays anything for it, it's still just a theory. Exactly. Exactly. So you yeah. So we are, charge for it. yeah, we're definitely on the side of charging for it, you know, um, especially if you're going to be giving access to you live. Um, so I love, I love that strategy of act actually letting your student almost co-build the course for you. Cause then you're actually tapping into what they want to learn. Um, and then you know what they really, what their pain points are and what the outcome is that they're looking for. So um, that's awesome. We've, got Michelle. Hey, Michelle, good to have you here. So Michelle says that the live versions are going to work for her. So she's going to do that with her. Business awesome. Account. Good. Michelle has a really successful fitness um, membership. Oh, is this my uh, Michelle? Michelle Abraham. Yeah. So she's uh, she's a local oh, Vancouver. Different right Michelle. Here. Different yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Rob Galvin. Hey, Rob, how's it going? Um, Hi, just going to see if we have any questions here. Okay, guys. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Oh, Laura's asking, how do you get into um, uh, Kim's inner circle? I dropped the link in there for you guys in the comments. So you guys can check out um, Kim's inner circle. Is that the link to my um, download or is that the link to my inner circle, Rob? Your inner circle. So both of awesome. them are there. So you guys have also the download, the 10 steps to launching your first online course. So pin awesome. that to the top so you guys can find it there. Um, okay, sorry. Just scrolling through here, guys. Thanks so much for all of your comments. Um, a lot of the questions are on how to build the audience. Uh, let's see here. And really, Rob, let me, let me, I mean, if that's a lot of the questions, let's talk about that for a second. Yep, sure. So, so again, you've got to know where your audience is. So that takes some research, right? Where are they hanging out and how, how can you go there and start creating the kind of content that they're consuming? So I was on a call with a client this morning. He was talking about your, your target audience are on the go. They're running all the time. What do they need? They need audio. They need to be able to listen in their car. They need to be able to listen on the subway. And so have video, sure, but also audio. So you kind of need to know how, you know, again, it's this whole process is testing your theories. So if you think that they're audio and they're on the go all the time, then maybe you start, you start guest podcasting on um, someone else's podcast and sharing what you know on that, that will start to grow your online audience. You know, if your people are video consumers, then you go to YouTube because YouTube is owned by Google, right? And indexed on Google. But let's not forget that your website is the central location. So put the video on YouTube, drop it into your website, you know, do a podcast, drop that into your website. Ideally, every piece of content that you're creating, you're, you know, you've got 50 different ways to repurpose it. Um, so there's, there's many ways. Start with one or two ways and do a 90-day challenge where you challenge yourself to produce one piece of content every single day. And then you share it wherever you can in front of your audience and you start building your following that way. 
Awesome, awesome. I've got a, I've got another question here. Um, how soon before launch should you pre-sale? How soon before launch? Well, I again, I think it. You know, there's a couple of components to it. Um, you don't want it so long, like three months, too long. People aren't gonna. They're gonna forget they even bought it, and they probably chance of selling it if they've got to wait three months for content. Um, I would say optimally, you're starting within four weeks. Four weeks. There you go. Four you weeks go. from, yeah. 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 And that's not too long to wait. And that gives you enough time to kind of get your content together. And perfect. that's what I mean. If you're not good with deadlines and you buckle under pressure, four yeah. weeks doesn't seem like a lot. But if you deliver it live, instead of trying to think, oh my gosh, I've got to film all these videos and have all these handouts ready and everything. Yes, you'll need to do some of that. But if you're delivering it live, it really cuts down on the amount that you need to. Yeah, it cuts down on the amount of prep work that I guess you would need to. Absolutely. You know, like making the videos, editing them and all that. So um, that's great. Um, Beth, uh, Kim, Beth's asking if, do you have a tutorial on how to drop video into your website using WordPress? Um, I don't know if we have a specific tutorial on it, but, um, you know, these are things that we teach people in the inner circle every day. Um, you could probably find, um, you know, I use a plugin, a YouTube plugin on my website. So as I add new YouTube videos, they're automatically added to a page on my website, which is called videos. Um, but you could do an individual blog post and, and on YouTube, you could just grab the embed code and embed it in your, um, you know, on your website. Again, you also want to look at the fact that you've got different learners. So someone who can't watch a video or doesn't want to, they, they may be readers, get that video transcribed and use that transcription as a blog post video into the website because Google loves that. Perfect. It's really good. Um, I'm just going to keep rattling off questions here, Kim. Yeah, and you guys just keep it. dropping them in here. Okay. So um, Jennifer's asking, I think, I mean, this is a horrible answer, but I think it really depends on your course, but she's asking how long is the average or typical online course in terms of hours? And do you provide supplementary materials to go with the online course? That's a really general question. And I, I can't actually give you an answer to that. It, it completely depends on the course, whether it's a course. So I consider a course really not hands-on. It's go in, do it yourself versus like a program, which probably has a live component to it. Um, and then you've got membership sites, right? So I don't know that there is, um, I, I don't know any statistics on the average amount. Something to consider though, is people don't buy based on the, how many hours are in this course. They buy based on the solution. So if they can get the solution to their problem in an hour, they'll buy it. If to an hour in six or to their, to their problem in six hours, then they'll buy that. But you don't have to throw in everything in the kitchen sink. You need to get them from A to Z as efficiently as possible um, for the highest completion rates. When you start adding in all these other stuff, just because you want to like fillers, stay away from fillers. Do you think that answered that question, Rob? I'm not so, sure. That's an, awesome, that's an awesome, that's an awesome answer. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I, you, you don't want to just make a course really long just so you can charge more for it. Yeah. It really is just focus on how do you get your students from, you know, where they are to, you know, the outcome where they want to be, where they want to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So don't, don't make it just long just so that, you know, Hey, it's eight hours. So now I can charge X dollars. You know, if you can just achieve that within, you know, an hour, um, then even better. Right. Yeah. So you might even actually do a lot better selling that. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jennifer, thanks. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, Annika, Annika Rogue, she's wondering, what do you feel um, is the best for going live, uh, Facebook or Zoom, or what do, you, what do you use? I mean, we use all types of different, like right now we are on Zoom, and then we're going from Zoom into Facebook Live. Um, so again, I think it depends on use cases, right? If you're talking about a mm -hmm. webinar, I prefer webinar software. I don't, I don't love Zoom webinars, but I use Zoom meetings for face-to-faces and small group meetings. Um, but I would use a webinar platform for delivering a webinar. Facebook lives are great for engagement and talking to your people. But again, then you can also use BeLive on 
you know, to stream into your, on your Facebook page or your Facebook group and have other people join you on that. So I think it really depends on the use case, what you're using it for. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Just all these good answers, guys. So, uh, Kim, I don't know how you are for time. If you still have time for more questions, I think there's I'm, some more I'm questions. good, Rob. Hit me You're with good? it. Yeah, I love okay. it. Sounds yeah. good. Um, okay, focusing. Thanks, Annika. Uh, Bruce has a question. This is a BC question. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, Kim. I'm not, to be honest. Um, what's the stance of the PTIB, Private Trading Industry Branch, on online course registration and compliance? Not a clue. Me neither. Yeah. Um, Bruce, if you are, if you want, probably the best thing to do with that is uh, send our team an email support at thinkific.com and we can dig into that a little bit further for you. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best thing to do with that. Um, Beth is ans asking <clears throat> for her course, where should I direct traffic, my website, my course sales page, or, you know, my other, my blab page. So um, <laughs> yeah, just it, it really depends what your goals are and where the traffic is coming from. So well, and whether it's cold or warm or hot traffic, right? Like yeah. what kind of traffic is it? If it's someone, so again, here's another, you know, thing I see course creators doing is they create this course, they get their sales page up and then they try and drive cold traffic to it. They, people have to go through a no like trust, try buy cycle. Some people will go through it in five minutes. Some people will go through it in two years. They have to get to know you. So what does that mean? You, you have to have someone introduce you, right? So if you're a guest on a podcast, that person is introducing you to their audience or they have to find your videos on YouTube or Facebook, or they have to find your Facebook group, or they have to find you on Instagram. They have to find you first. They got to get to know who you are and then they have to connect with you, right? So they have to believe that they like you enough to actually want to continue to see what you have to offer. And I'm not talking about paid offers. I'm talking about free content that you have to be producing. So they've got to know you, they've got to like you, and then they've got to trust you in order to try something that you have. And they're not going to try your 499 course at that point. They're going to opt into a freebie. They're going to join you for a webinar. They're going to um, check out your, your training videos. They might buy one of your lower priced intro courses, right? They're going to try something that you have. And if you don't deliver on that, you are never going to sell them on your $4.99 or $9.99 or $39.99 course. So they have to go through this cycle. So if you're talking about cold traffic, driving them to a sales page, you are not going to have any conversions. Driving warm traffic to a sales page, you're probably going to have some conversions if you've listened to what they want and you've produced it. It sounds really doom and gloom, but it's not because it all starts with building your online audience. And there's no quick, there's no quick solution for that. Yeah, there's definitely no shortcut to it. If you're going to build a, a true following of loyal, you know, a loyal audience, there's really no shortcut to it. I mean, you can get a lot, a lot of people into your list through, you know, paid ads and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, you still have to, you still have to nurture that and you still have to get them to trust you and get to know you. So um, yeah, that's great. Um, Gene and our friends in New York, they have question, a question here. Uh, sorry, I missed it, Gene. Uh, that's my bad. Um, how do you get people to pay for a course that's not built yet? I think you covered this a little bit, but maybe dive into it, Kim, if you don't mind. Um, how do you get people to pay for a course that's not built yet? Um, that's really it. So, How do you get people? Well, I mean, people buy courses all the time and they don't know what the contents of that course is. Right? So there's there, if they don't know what the content of the course is and they're still going to buy it, then they're probably still going to buy a course that's not created yet. A, yes, you can be transparent about that if you want, but I wouldn't put on my pre-sales page, this course has not yet been built. Yeah. You have and are in the process of validating that people will pay for this course. You are going to put together your pre-sales page as if you had created the course. So that's, that's, I mean, it really is, that's, that's the marketing. That's your course sales page. That's how you warm them up before you send them to the course sales page. They don't necessarily know that it's not built yet. Um, and quite frankly, it doesn't, it doesn't affect them whether it's built yet or not. If you have a proven track record, you should have some social proof. If you're really an expert and an authority or 10 steps ahead of those who really want to learn how to do this, 
like don't get freaked out by the word expert. If you're 10 steps ahead of someone else who doesn't know how to do this, in their eyes, you're an expert. So if you have, you know, if you have been practicing what you preach, you should be able to communicate them um, through your social proof, clients you've worked with, workshops you've run, webinars you've hosted, something that is going to build their trust. But you're never going to send a cold, a cold audience to a sales page and sell them. There is a whole process of warming them up before they get to the sales page. Did that answer that question, Rob? I kind of feel like I went on a tangent. No, no, that's good. Yeah, Jean, let, let us know if that answered the question. Now, um, yeah. I've got a question. So um, on that landing page for your pre-sale course, are you putting in, um, are you coming up with the outline at least? Sort of like, Absolutely. you know, like you said, yeah. So at the very least, come up with the outline, right? Absolutely. So, so what week, you think what you think that's going to look like, right? If you're delivering it live, that may morph and change. So after you deliver, you know, lesson one on chocolate cake, you might get 10 questions from your 20 beta testers who say, yeah, but you didn't really go into what kind of eggs are the best eggs. Before you get to the icing, you got to deal with the eggs. So you might change the second lesson to talk about eggs versus moving on to icing because you think they're ready for icing. When we're creating the outline, we imagine the steps that they'll be going through. But this is where that live feedback comes in. If they're telling you, no, we're not ready for that icing step yet, you've got to be flexible enough to go, okay, then lesson two is going to be on, on eggs. Lesson three is going to be on icing. Got it. Make sense? Yep. Makes sense. So the outline can morph and, and change and transform. And then you want to make sure that you uh, fully cover, you know, lesson one before you go into, you know, your lesson two. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So you should, I mean, yes, you need an outline. You need a, what I call a raw course outline. Um, and you need to know, I mean, that's really more about what topics you're going to cover and what learning outcomes are going to be from those topics. So what are they going to learn how to do? How are they, how are they going to transform through this process? Um, you know, th those are all the same kinds of things that you would put on a sales, an actual sales page for a course that's already created. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, thanks. So let, let us know if that answered the question there, guys. Uh, yeah. Kush Mark had a question. How important is background and setting when making videos for courses? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know no, what? You say. Yeah. We, we tend to get distracted by little details. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, my first courses, I had a white sheet hanging behind me. <laughs> that's the, that's the truth. They're yeah. still on YouTube. It's hilarious to look back on, but the reality is you want them to focus on you and what you are talking about and how are you are helping them. And if you're doing a good job of that, then nothing back here matters. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, you don't want to have a sink full of dirty dishes behind you right? Or kids running back and forth. It, I mean, if you're doing a parenting course, that might work. Again, you got to know who your audience is. But, you know, a, a clean background, especially if you're just starting out, you'll get better and better and better at it. But the initial attempt, it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I agree. I think more, even more importantly is actually your audio. So audio is um, super important. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah. So I think audio is a lot more important. You know, some people will actually like watch your videos, but actually go on different tabs while they're listening to you. So the audio has to be really clear. Yeah. Um, but also on the other side, uh, it depends on the kind of course, you know, I know Michelle Abraham, she has a fitness course. And so her videos are really, it's really important for her to have good videos because people want to see what she's doing, all the different movements. Um, you know, and whereas, I don't mean it's not important. I mean, it's yeah. one of those things that course creators, especially when you're just starting out, you want perfection, right? You, yeah. it has to look perfect, but it doesn't, it doesn't need, it needs to be good quality. You need to be engaging, but their attention should be on you. Not what is happening here behind you. Perfect. Um, okay. And, oh, I uh, got a question from Jean. Uh, Kim, uh, so she's wondering, is the inner circle part of your membership? Yes. So um, we have, I think, 18 or 22 full courses in there that our members have access to. Plus, they can book one-on-one -on -one calls with us. Um, we both, myself and my co-instructor, Lynn, 
Um, she's a sales funnel strategist and Facebook ads expert. And so between the two of us, we have a tremendous amount of experience. And so they can book one-on-one -on -one calls with us through the week as well. So that is a private uh, Facebook group where we all hang out there. And then they also have access to the online training center with um, uh, 22 courses in it. Awesome. Awesome. I've heard, I've heard a lot of great things uh, with your membership. So if, if you go to our Facebook group, guys, um, I'll link it into, uh, into the comments. If you're um, watching this through our Facebook page, you may not know, but we actually have a Facebook group for um, all of our course creators. So um, I'll link that there and you can, you can go in there and you'll see a lot of Kim's students, a lot of her members, and um, they're just raving about all the things that they're doing in there and all the results that they're achieving. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely check that out. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go through here. Maybe we can take one or two more questions, Kim. And I think we're coming up to our hour. So I want to respect people's time. Sure. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that is it. Bruce, uh, Bruce, that's, that's great. Bruce, I saw your comment here. Please email us. I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure we've got all of that stuff covered as far as, you know, uh, compliance and all that stuff. So, um, our, uh, our, co uh, our founder, Greg Smith, was actually previously a uh, practicing lawyer, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we got it all covered. So, um, yeah, but email us anyway. We want to dive and we want to make sure we answer your questions. Um, our email is super easy. It's just support at thinkific.com, and I'll put it in the comments. So if you guys are watching this on the replay um, and you guys have questions, drop it, drop it into the comments. We will still likely um, be watching this. Um, yeah. But if you want an answer from our support team, support at thinkific.com. That's the best place to go. Yeah, right. Exactly, Bruce. Yeah, Greg would know for sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll check with him. <laughs> um, great. Uh, oh, and Gene had a pre-sale pricing question. Gene, just drop into the comments here. I will uh, ask Kim for you. Uh, Sophie, uh, Sophie, uh, just want to thank you, Kim, for sharing your clarity and your advice. Thank you, Sophie. Appreciate it. Glad you could be here. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. Um, yeah, Madeline's here too. Thanks, Madeline, for joining us. Um, yeah, I think that is it. Let me just check on Jean here. She had a question about pre-sale pricing. Yeah, I'm glad so many people showed up for this because it really is a, a great strategy, especially for first-time course creators, um, you know, to really start off on the right foot. Um, I see a lot that are still struggling a year or two later, and I really think it's because they're trying to create a course first and then trying to figure out the marketing, and it's backwards, um, and it, it's going to be a lot harder to to do it that way. So I'm I'm really encouraged by the fact that so many people are sort of interested and in, and and you know considering this maybe as an option for themselves. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, I'm I'm glad that you guys took the time out of your day. It's it's afternoon here, and whatever time it is where you are, and and really learn this stuff because you know just this these this advice from Kim can really change you know the outcome of your next few weeks, right? A lot of people just dive in and start creating their courses, or you could start pre-selling and really learning what your students want to learn, and then and then deliver that knowledge to them, right? You have that knowledge anyway, right? You may just have like ten different things that you can teach, and then you choose the wrong one without checking with your potential students. And that could, you know, cost you, you know, a month, weeks, you know. So um, yeah, thanks for everyone that's joining. Um, Jean, I want to answer your pre-sale question. So um, <laughs> your pre-sale pricing question. So maybe uh, Kim, talk about that again. I know you, you touched on that, but what yeah, do you, you price? Know, I'm not the, I'm not the pricing queen, Rob. I, yeah, um, no. <laughs> no, I'm really not. I think that I, I really do think that it is, it's about the solution it's, it's where's the, um, what can the market bear? First of all, I mean, you could say, and again, I hear this all the time. This is a great course. It's worth $3,000. Well, it might be worth $3,000 to you, but is it worth $3,000 to your audience? That's what matters. Mm -hmm. And so it really has to, I mean, I wish I had, I wish I had more advice for you, but it depends on a whole bunch of things. Is there a live component how much do you actually have to do with them? Um, is it a, a hot topic that they really want to learn or is it a luxury item, right? Um, if it's a luxury item and it's not necessarily going to, you know, change their life or their business, um, you know, the hierarchy of needs, if it has to do with, um, you know, eating, health, um, sex, relationships, um, you know, so that could be divorce, marriage, all of those things. 
um, sleep, um, any of those sort of like primary needs, those are, can generally be a higher price point because you really are, that's like a, um, it's, it's a need. It's not a, it's not for someone, for someone who has an eating disorder, let's say they, this is critical. This might be life or death to them. This might be, um, 30 years of being overweight and suffering and being depressed. That's going to hold a lot more weight than how to choose the right purse for your spring outfit. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Um, it's not very helpful, but that's just, <laughs> yeah. And again, this is part of like, even the, like, I think the, the pricing is also part of the whole pre-selling, you know, sort of test and learning. That's something that you, you'll learn, you know, if you, if you pre, you know, if you set it, your pre-sell to, you know, $99 and all of a sudden you had like a thousand people signing up, then you've obviously probably underpriced it. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, um, that's something that you'll learn throughout, through this whole process. So, um, I think the first place to go, if you guys are, are doing this is definitely download Kim's guide with the 10 things to, 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 to do when you are creating your first course. Um, I've linked that in the comments. Um, Kim, you thank guys you so also much. Have a, you guys also have a pricing article on your website, right? We Rob? Do. Yeah, yeah, we do. That I'll put that in. To link to. Yep. Yep. That's great. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. So yeah, I'll drop that into the comments. Um, yeah, and Rob, sorry, let me add one more thing in about pricing. Yeah. And that is when you do your course evaluation or your survey at the end, of the, what should, you should have one in every single course, you need their feedback. Um, one of the questions that I always ask in a pre-sale course is based on your experience in this course, or based on this solution that you've, or, or this transformation that you've achieved, do you believe that the price charged is more or less than than what the value of the course is. Mm -hmm. And if you produced a really good course, they're probably gonna say, I would have paid twice this. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good way to gauge that pre-sale. I mean, you, you sort of take an educated guess based on a number of factors, and then you tweak that. Perfect, perfect. Guys, Everything about this whole process, experimentation and testing. And learning, yeah, yeah, exactly. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Kim, thank you so much for taking an hour of your afternoon. I know you're super busy right now with uh, so many different projects happening and it's awesome. So guys, Thanks, thank you Bob. so much. Um, yeah, so I've linked all of Kim's uh, sites and her membership and also her free download and guides in there. Our Facebook group is all in the comments. And if you have any other questions beyond here, uh, send us an email, support at thinkific.com. Thanks to everyone that joined us. Um, also, just a quick sort of plug is that in, time is it now? Four o'clock here. So in two hours, we're going to be back live on Facebook with my good friend, Patty McGill. He's our affiliate manager here at Thinkific. And he's going to be talking about um, how to work with affiliates to promote your online course. So um, tune in for that. We're going to be going live again at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. Okay, so that's in a couple hours. Um, if you guys have any questions, Kim uh, is part of our Facebook group. So she's in there. So if you guys uh, have any questions for her, drop them just in there. Just tag well. me in it. Yeah. Yeah, just tag, just tag Kim. Um, and I'll link her actual website. She's got a website, Brainy Girl. Uh, so it's, um, I'll link that into the comments. And then, um, yeah, we'll go from there. So awesome. um, Kim, thank you so much again. This, Thanks, you, you Rob. Dropped, shared so many good insights here. So uh, hopefully you guys take that into action and then let us know in the group guys how things went if you tested any of these things out um, how it went share that in the group we'd love to hear about it yeah and bye gene and new york people bye new york yeah hopefully you guys have any uh, uh had a, a good session with us and uh gene i'll um i'll send you a, a message right after this okay awesome bye guys Great. see you guys